Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. The record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1 800 534 8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Orit Connor. Good morning and welcome to For the Record. Today being Friday, the 21st of July, 2017. I want to thank you, our listening and viewing audience for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working somewhere in the outdoors. Of course, for the record is a show produced by the staff and management of Radio Cayman and it is geared towards keeping you abreast of issues as they arise and play out in the local, regional and international scene. I'm your host, Dorit Connor. My co-hosts are Ms. Teresa Pitcairn and Dr. Steve McField, you're welcome to join us in the conversation by calling us on our toll-free number provided courtesy of Flow. That toll-free number is 1-800-534-8255. You can also call us on 949-8037 and 949-6990. Of course, if you don't like to talk on the telephone, you can email us at for the record. That is one word for the record at C A N D W dot K Y. So I'm going to say good morning to my two co hosts this morning, and I trust that both of you had a restful and uneventful uh, evening and night. Good morning. Good morning, OC. Good, good, good morning. Good morning, Dr. McField. Good morning, my colleagues uh, here, and um, good morning to you, and good morning to all your listening audience locally and abroad. I know you have a lot of following abroad. So good morning to them also. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Of course, today we are going to continue with our conversation in relation to the twenty seventeen election observer report on the Cayman Islands elections of for the twenty fourth of May two thousand and seven. That's the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association's Observer uh, Mission. Um, and before we get into all of the, uh, the recommendations where we left off on Wednesday, um, I took the opportunity to look at some reports uh, that were produced in relation to other jurisdictions. Um, I looked at the Anguilla um, 2015 report, and I also looked at the Turks and Caicos Islands uh, report of uh, December of 2016. And what I what I what I found were some inconsistencies. I I also considered whether or not the supervisor of elections here in the Cayman Islands or in any of those jurisdictions had the opportunity to see the dra a draft of the report before it was published and whether or not they were afforded the opportunity to offer any comments to say whether or not they agreed or disagreed uh, with certain points uh, in the um, in the report and the recommendations. So that is, that is something that I'm curious because when you look at, for instance, when audits are done, I know, you know within government, for instance, when, when audits are done, the auditors will do a draft report, present it to you, give you an opportunity to make comments you know, in relation to it, and then you get the final report you know, as well, whether or not an opportunity was given in those instances. I believe that that may have helped somewhat to correct some of the inaccuracies that were in the report um, and in other reports as well. What I also found 
extremely interesting in some jurisdictions, and we'll, we, we'll talk about some of these. Uh, for instance, those persons who are eligible to run for office, those who are eligible to be um, nominated to be members of the government, of the Legislative Assembly, the Parliament, or whatever. For instance, in the Turks and Caicos Islands, ministers of religion, believe it or not, are barred from running for political office. Ministers of religion. Uh, we saw in the case of Anguilla, I saw in the case of Anguilla, and also in the case of the Turks and Caicos, and similarly in the case of the Cayman Islands, where they spoke about the fact that our Constitution also speaks to the point that if you're holding if you, uh, public office, that you are not allowed to run as well. What was interested in all of those cases, except for the Cayman Islands report, was that they, in those two instances, 2016, 2015, they pointed out the percentage of the voting population that the civil service represented and how that drew away from potential candidates. And what, in one recommendation, they pointed out that it would, they, their recommendation would be that civil servants be allowed to run for office, means that they, they take a leave of absence from their job, and if they're mm -hmm. unsuccessful, then they're able to return to the, their jobs on the same grade and at the same salary. That was an interested recommendation, but they didn't make that recommendation um, for, yeah. for the Cayman Islands. Yeah. So there were, there were inconsistent, there were situations where they were similar in three jurisdictions, Cayman Islands, Anguilla, and Turks and Caicos Islands, but in some instances, recommendations were made, and in other instances, they went completely silent on it, and I have documented those, and throughout the show this morning, um, we will go over those as, as well. Uh, now, I think when we stopped uh, on Wednesday, we were on recommendation number nine, was, were, were we? I think we were, we were on recommendation number nine. So we're going to look at that recommendation. But before we go there, I want to give both of you an opportunity to make any comments. I, you know, started out on, on you know, where we started on Wednesday, but there may be a, uh, something that you may want to talk about, you may want to point out before we move forward. So I want to give both of you an opportunity. Well, there are just two things I would like to mention this morning. Okay. One is the um, the unfortunate position that this our speaker has found himself in another country, in a foreign country, mm -hmm. and all of the um, comments that are on the blogs all over about whether or not the the premier is going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I would like to um, share with them the fact that the premier can't do anything about it. Because the speaker is not the servant of the premier. He's the servant of the Legislative Assembly. And it's the Legislative Assembly who who um who 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 appointed him. And it's for, it's only the Legislative Assembly who can who can remove him. And um if you look at the history of the speakership and the tradition of the speakership which was, uh, you know, the first speaker, I, I believe, was in, in, in the UK was appointed in 1377. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an enormous high position. And in, and in, and in the UK, the, on the Westminster system of, 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 of Parliament, a speaker can only be removed for certain things. For one, number one, if he commits a criminal offense in office, Number two, if he's unsound in mind and body, that means if he's sick, ill, and he's mentally ill, he can't uh, continue the job. Or if there's a successful motion of no confidence in him by the, by the, by the parliament or by the legislature, then, he, then, then you can remove him. But otherwise, the premier can't 
remove him. It's not the same as Kenneth as Kenneth as as Kenneth Bryan. People say, well, he did it to Kenneth Bryan. Well, it's not the same situation as Kenneth Bryan. Yeah, he was an employee. He's an of employee the of the premier. He, he, the speaker is an employee of the legislature. Legislature. And anyway, that's that's not that's number one. Number two is something I read this morning in the. I read oh, as I was coming in uh, last night. I mean, on my on my on my computer about the um, compass. The compass has a really damning um, critique of the election in Bermuda. Uh, have, you, have you read it? Oh yeah, and and when it talks yeah. about uh, election results could impact came on. Could impact came yes. on. Mm -hmm. Now, the the the, the Dunkley. Um, um, Dunkley's party, the U, the one, the Bermuda party, yeah. uh, went to the polls, and the people in Bermuda spoke, and they gave them a resounding defeat. And the the opposition party in Jamaica is now the government with an enormous amount of seats, and the compass took the compass is taking up um, umbrage to that, and are saying that because they are now in power, that all of these awful things are going to happen to Bermuda, and that we are going to benefit from it. And this this puts me in to 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 to, to the, the proposition that these recommendations of the Commonwealth Parliamentary observers has the same line of thinking like the Compass that we people must not be masters of our own destiny in our own house, and that and that once we once that happens to us once we start taking a position where we become a master of the wound, how they criticize us and saying all, all manner of things is going to happen to us and um and don't wish us well and that is something that i that i that i take umbrage to this morning the people of bermuda went to the polls and they elected the government they wanted and so did we we went to the polls and we elected the government that we that we wanted and we and we and we are stuck with those people now until the next four years if we don't want them we can turn them out and elect new people mm -hmm. And so, and so here we are. Here we are in such a small country where so many people from outside has such a great, 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 great um, 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 stance about what we should do and what we should not do, you know. And it's like I said in my closing remarks the other day. It seems to me that the great prize for some of them now is the legislative assembly. They want to control the legislative system. They have control the social and economic system now, and they want to control the political system now. And um, and and every time that I read these recommend some of these recommendations, I really cringe to see how they wanted to control us from outside. Why are they so interested in this little small country? Um, they never were interested before when we were all here and we were all in one boat together mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and you know fighting the mosquitoes and nobody warned us and it was calling us that we were the place of time for god yeah, they're saving time for god for, 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 <laughs> forgotten us so why are they so interested in us now and that's the question i want to ask the audience outside in the cayman Islands and abroad and abroad this Ms. morning misty misty anything you see and our gov uh for, for first of us First of all, let me say good morning also to our listening audience. Mm -hmm. It's really a pleasure to continue to be here. It's an honor to be here and also an honor to know that folks actually listen to us and actually respect uh, some of the things that we say. They should know that we don't talk about the research that we do. You will say, for example, this is what I'll send you a little text mm -hmm. and it says, O.C., what do you want us to discuss uh, because, you know, we always want to come prepared right, and so on. Yes. But we do our separate research. Mm -hmm. So Steve won't know what I came with this morning. <laughs> Neither will you. <laughs> I read the Compass's uh, uh, perspective and I was dumbfounded. I, I just shook my head. And this is what I wrote this morning. <laughs> uh, and it's really a replication of the statement that the PLP made right before the elections. Bermuda has suffered for four years under the government that was just swept out, and our families cannot withstand another term of their divisive policies and arrogant leadership. In the last four years, Bermuda has lost 2,000 jobs to, Bermuda, to Bermudians. Bermuda's debt has doubled, and the gap between the haves and the have-not has increased. Bermudians are enduring an ever-increasing cost of living with wages that aren't covered, covering their needs, Parents and students are suffering with under-resourced public education, and these things are merely an afterthought of the previous government. I'm really dovetailing what um, Steve has just said, in that 
we must know when we suffer. And, you know, today, it's not just one Cayman we have, you know. We have one and possibly two different Caymans. And the second Cayman, the rights and privilege privileges afforded to that second Cayman, of which I feel that I am a part of, you know, you don't you don't get those same privileges at all. So Caymanians must have a right to speak in their own community. Yeah. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Art Connor. My co-host in the studio with me this morning, Ms. Theresa Pitkin, Dr. Steve McField. Please stay tuned. We're going to commercial break now. And For the Record, we'll be back immediately after. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me, my two co-hosts, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn and Dr. Steve McField. We're continuing our discussion on the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Observer Mission to the Cayman Islands for the May 24, 2017 general elections. In doing so, we uh, have also looked at other reports from other jurisdictions. We've looked uh, at the... Anguilla report, and we have looked at the Turks and Caicos report. I just want to place um, a marker and say as that fundamentally, I am not opposed to the presence of election observer missions, mm -hmm. because here in the Cayman Islands, we have absolutely nothing to hide, and we can always benefit from the oversight of others and look at suggestions that they have made and see whether or not we want to accept them. But at the same time, we must carefully critique their work. We must carefully critique their recommendations. We must look at what they have done, what they have said in other jurisdictions to see whether or not they're, they are consistent in their approach, bearing in mind that not every country gets the benefit of the same observer mission they're mixed. But what we have seen in the Caribbean, for instance, is uh, Mr. Rodin and Mr. Galea, they have led missions so far in places like the Cayman Islands and in Anguilla and I believe in the Turks and Caicos Islands as well. So it is important for us to critique to look at what they have said in other jurisdictions that have similar legislation to ours, or uh, you know, some parts of their legislation are similar. One of the, in the Anguilla report of 2050, uh, 2015 election, one of the um, conventions or um, a covenants that the mission relied on was Article 25 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights. They relied on that in relation to the right to vote and the right to stand for political office. And Article 25 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights reads, and I quote, every citizen, bear, bear in mind that word citizen, every citizen shall have the right and opportunity without any uh, distinctions mentioned in Article 2 and without unreasonable restrictions, A, to take part in the conduct of public affairs directly or through freely chosen representatives, B, to vote and to be elected at genuine periodic elections which shall be by universal suffrage and shall be held by secret ballot guaranteeing the free expression of the will of the electors. So, it says that every citizen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say every Residence. person or citizens and residents. Oh, every resident. So, we are in compliance with Article 25 of the International Con uh, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Exco of course, and I agree with that because citizen um, translated by, from article that, from that article means in Cayman, every person of Caymanian status has the right to vote, and that's what we have been doing. 
We have everybody in Cayman who has Cayman status has the right to vote. All they have, all you have to do is go and register. So, so you know, these people come over here and they think we must be foo foo because <laughs> we don't think we read. Perhaps some of the legislative assembly members don't read, but sure. So the three of us read, and the three of us research what what, what we're doing, um, what, what what we're saying. So I agree with that, and I agree with their recommendations. So it's it goes to show you that they're not talking about every Caymanian from the, uh, every Caymanian Cayman Sarasola that they t- that they're really talking about every resident should have the right to vote, mm-hmm. and that is and that is their aim. As I have said before, it seems to me now that the great prize, the next prize that they want to grab hold of is the legislative assembly. And they can only get that by making every resident, person residents here have the right to vote instead of every Caymanian citizen, which translates to every Caymanian from uh, people of Caymanian status. Mm-hmm. Misty? Yeah, the only thing that I would have added to that, and I, and that particular provision is really important because, as you know, that actually deals with rights for political participation. Mm-hmm. But... I wanted to focus on that word citizenship because, you know, people may interpret it in a way that is not relevant in this context. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Citizenship under this in this particular context assumes that it is a right that you have been granted, as, for example, that we have in our immigration law, we grant Caymanian status. So that person becomes a member of a country having rights because he or she was granted citizenship under the relevant legislation, mm-hmm. yeah, and one of the one of the errors that I saw in the report as well that they they pointed they stated that uh, Caymanian status is governed by the British, British Nationality Act. That is a fallacy. That is a fallacy. That is that is just that is governed by our immigration um, law. Our immigration law, <laughs> and, that's comes, the, and that's the problem it, it, with it. That's governed by immigration law and not by our constitution. Yeah. It comes back to the point that I raised in the last show. These folks don't read. And they assume that they are involved with a, a nation where all of them don't read and don't understand these things. But yeah, this show is unique, OC, because we call folks that we don't do it irreverently. We do it respectfully because that's a part of our culture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we, you know, we we speak the speak and we walk the walk. Okay, folks, I want to remind you that you are listening to For the Record. I am your host, Dorit Connor, my co-host, Ms. Teresa Pitkern, and Dr. Steve Macfield. We're going to the 8 o'clock news. When we return, the conversation will continue, and we're going to start off with recommendation number 8. We're going to look at that. Uh, that was made by the Observer Mission to the Cayman Islands for the 2017 general elections. Please stay tuned. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me, Ms. Teresa Pitkin, Dr. Steve McField. We are discussing the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Observer Mission to the Cayman Islands for our 2017 general elections. Uh, and we say that we're going to be going and looking at um, requ- uh, recommendation number nine. Before we go there, I want to re-examine recommendation number seven. Uh, there, are, there are two parts to uh, recommendation number seven. Uh, it states, um, uh, well, first it says, um, the, the comment is that publication of personal data of voters in the process of revision and dissemination of the voter registry may encroach upon the individual right to privacy. So the way that we publish it, what is published there, may encroach on the individual right to privacy. So their recommendation is that one data protection law should be introduced, which we pointed out that you know uh, data protection legislation has been um, passed in the Cayman Islands, which requires that personal data gathered for electoral purposes be treated in a manner which respects the right to privacy. Now, this is the part. Furthermore, removing the requirement for voters to state their occupation when presenting themselves to vote could avoid demeaning situations in the case of some voters. That is what, that is their recommendation for the Cayman Islands in 2017. 
that they said that um, removing the requirement for voters to state their occupation when presenting themselves to vote could avoid demeaning situations in the case of some voters. Now, here is what they said in uh, the Turks uh, and uh, Caicos Islands in, in relation um, to that. Uh, uh, they, they, they claim here, they said, uh, sorry, this is in the BVI, sorry, in the 2015 BVI report, the Election Observer Mission stated, as required by the voting procedures, poll clerks should consistently ask voters to confirm their names and address even when identification is provided. <laughs> so they're saying in the Cayman Islands, when we require them to call it out, that it could be demeaning to some um, voters. But it's a in requirement. In the Turks and Caicos, it's a requirement, and they also recommend that all poll clerks should consistently mm -hmm. ask voters to confirm their name. Now, let, let, let's just look at that for a minute. The voting procedure, you have the agents of candidates and maybe some candidates as well who are present in the polling station. They are situated in such a way that they can see the voter when they enter the polling station and our law says that they can hear when they call out their name, address, and occupation as well. And that is number one, so that they can check the name off the list but also, being a small jurisdiction, and at one time everybody knew everybody, it's not like that now, mm -hmm. but still to ensure that there is no personation, that, that you're not saying that you're some, who, uh, who you're not. You, you, you're not saying that you're someone who you're, who you're not. So, yes, you, you may have the identification card, but it is required to be called out as well, because if you're showing the identification card to the poll clerk and the presiding officer, the agents who are present don't know what's going on. The agents are the heirs and eyes and ears of their candidates. They're there to observe the proceedings to ensure that everything goes smoothly. So that, that was the reason for that. Any comments on that? No, the only, when we discussed it the last time, what I thought about was um, the fact that so many of us had similar surnames um, historically. So if, for example, you have a Heather Ebanks from Bordentown and a Heather Ebanks from West Bay, um, you know, there are circumstances in which those persons could be uh, mis. You, you would, it would be unclear whether or not you're looking for the same um, Heather Ebanks. So when you put the address and the um, occupation as well, you get more confirmation to ensure that the person that you are actually dealing with is not an impersonation or somebody else from a different district. I just thought that it added accuracy. I agree because you could have Heather Ebanks in West Bay, voting in West Bay, and Heather Ebanks coming in Bordentown and voting in Bordentown as too. well. Mm -hmm. As well, and, yeah. and, and and you would know until yeah. after yeah. something. Unt you would know until after something happened. Really, yeah. you mm -hmm. would not know yeah. until after something happened, and and you have to go back to the ballot to see who actually voted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's yeah. a that's a problem. And I I think that you see all these recommendations are very superficial an off-the-cuff recommendation without any detailed uh, investigation into or any research into into the different territories and, and, and how their uh, elections law operates, really. Okay. Now, one of the other things that they didn't uh, comment on in the Cayman Islands, and I noticed that in the two jurisdiction, jurisdictions that I, I, I looked at, that they still use the ink on the finger to indicate that you have voted already. <laughs> Now, that is not necessary in the Cayman mm -hmm. Islands, and the reason that that is not necessary is that the voting list is broken down by each constituent, see? And not only by each constituency, but that constituency list may be broken down in alphabetical order, especially if you have more than one polling station in there. So 
you won't have a list where if you're in Bodentown East, that you, your name appears on the Bodentown West list, that it is not possible. So only those persons who are registered and who are on the list for Bodentown East will be able to vote there. If you are registered somewhere else and you go to Bodentown East, they're not going to find your name on the list. So that is what we have accomplished here in the Cayman Islands, which eliminates the need for us to use the ink on the finger to indicate uh, whether or not the person um, you know, has voted. Okay, let's then go look at the um, recommendation number nine, blanket ban on the denial of the right to vote to all prisoners serving sentences in excess of 12 months regardless of the nature of the crime involved that we should review that. I agree. The, the, the blanket, the blanket. I don't uh, think ban. so. I don't think so. I think when you, when you have committed an offense and, um, and you go, and you go to serve your, your offense, you've given up all your civil, civic rights. That is one, that is the punishment for, 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 for violating the, 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 the norms and the rights of the majority of the people in the, in the place in which you live. You can't have you can't be doing that and then have rights in in the prison too to vote and to decide who's going to be um, ruling the country. The country you give up those rights as a, as a prisoner, mm -hmm. and 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 you know to come to say that you should let them vote too, when when they have committed offenses is that that is that is part of that that is part of the punishment that that you ostracize from 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 this from society and that you've been rehabilitated while you're there to mm -hmm. come back into society mm -hmm. and so to, to to regain those rights again at some time at some point in time okay mr T obviously disagree yeah, with that and I, I and for me it actually depends on the nature and the heinous nature of the crime okay. because okay. i know historically how we used to put people in prison for one little spliff of ganja mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. leave them there to rot added no ad nauseum no I, I i really think that we need to have a review on that because certain of our values are not actually steeped in research and and a clear understanding of uh some of the nature of the decisions that we make and again i use the ganja today that we now see cures cancer and all this kind of stuff and i'm not saying i'm not suggesting that you know um that we just go all out with this. Uh -huh. I am saying that we need to take another look because many of the crimes that we that you know folks commit are actually a reflection of our own deep prejudices. And we find that we actually enforce that on a certain community and a certain element in our community. So you so you feel then um, that the right to vote if you're incarcerated should be based on the nature of the crime that you have committed as opposed to the sentence that you're serving. Well, it and uh, and perhaps a bit of both. Okay. Yeah, the right to vote is really crucial. It's your way of having a say in the community in which you live. But you you have yeah. been removed from that community of sorts yeah. when you've been put uh, put in prison. You've been sure. you, you've been separated from from society. Yeah, it's it's like being it's like when you were living in a time when it was legal for slavery and you were simply putting people in prison yeah. because you didn't like yeah. the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. No. Those are the prejudices that we've now discovered with time that, you know, you really, that those can't fly. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Well, uh, good, two good uh, points in, in relation to that. We would have to get a jury now <laughs> yeah. to, to do <laughs> <laughs> The jury is still <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, OC, we can agree to disagree. disagree. Yes, oh, yes. It's awesome. And we don't yeah. take it personal. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look at the right to stand for election. Recommendation number 10. <laughs> Uh, the legal rules determining who is entitled to be nominated as a candidate for election should be reviewed. The residency requirements appear to be excessively long while there is inequality in the treatment of different people depending upon the mode of their acquisition of citizenship. Now, we talked extensively about this on Wednesday, yes. but, mm -hmm. we, but we, we, we need to talk you know about it again and if need be we go back and look again at article 25 of the international covenant on civil and political rights that talks about the word and includes the word citizen every citizen so we have pointed out before in this regard 
It's in our constitution. We went through constitutional negotiations with the UK. When you look at other jurisdictions, when I looked at Turk and, and Caicos, when you look at um, uh, Anguilla, basically the same requirements, you know, in there, in some instances, they point out that you have to have a parent or a grandparent who was born uh, in the jurisdiction, you know, as well. Um, they're saying that we need to look at it. We have looked at it already. We have decided this is what we want. And uh, like Dr. Mark Field said before, control over our legislative assembly is probably the only thing that we have left. Do we want to give that up? At no, this stage? we don't want to give yeah. that up. Yeah. And we're not going to give the vote to someone who is not a Caymanian as defined under the I immigration law and has the right to stand for um, office under the Constitution. We're not going to do that. That kite is not going to fly. And as long as they're trying to get that fly off the ground, it's not going to go because we are not going to allow that kite to fly. The, the thing is to, you know, O.C., we need to ask that question, and, I, and I, I'm interjecting a bit of truth serum here this morning. <laughs> we need to ask the question about why non-Caymanians being conferred the right to vote makes so many Caymanians these days feel disenfranchised. That was what I. That was the statement mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I had this morning before um, Steve and I came on to discuss what was in the compass. But that's where this statement came from, okay. as I read it. And to answer this, we have to understand how our oligarch oligarchy or economic elite and I mean past and present right. how they historically manipulated our immigration policies to entrench their own hegemony in our community today and in the process marginalize the Caymanian people you know we, we we let's be real let's ask that tough question and and take it from there and as Steve say that kite that folks are talking about can't fly not at this time and, and, you know, um, the, the people who came before us, the people who actually set this system up before us, they were very wise, you know. A lot of them traveled before we did to other countries and saw what was going on. A lot of them. I can name a lot of them. The great stalwarts, the great statesmen like Captain Reed, who stood his ground for the Cayman and people against governors for the rights of Cayman and people. Great orators like Clifton Hunter. I mean, when you went down to the Legislative Assembly and you heard him, the flourishing phraseology and how he debate um, wasn't like today. Um, and, 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 and also and also also the great patriot like Armand Panton and, 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 and the philosophy of, 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 of Mr. Jim Borden and also Mr. Mr. Warren Conley, who made it very plain, came on, it's not for everybody. Cayman is not for everyone. So everyone come here can't expect that Cayman is going to be for them. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the right to select who we want to come to in our house. We still own our own home, and we have the right to say who's going to sit in our drawing room and who's not going to sit in our drawing room. And people ought to people ought to understand that now because that's a very sensible and emotional thing in Cayman Islands now, yeah, especially so. yeah. especially now so with, 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 uh, the, the way our, our economy has been structured now that we need so many people from outside. Okay. When we return, uh, we're going to look at the comment that there ought to be equality um, in the law and consistency as to how it is interpreted and uh, that has to do with uh, disqualification for from eligibility to stand for election based on dual uh, nationality or allegiance to a foreign power. Please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back right after this short commercial break. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. We're continuing our discussion on the 2017 election observer mission to the Cayman Islands uh, report on our election. The made the comment that, that there ought to be equality in the law and consistency as to how it is interpreted. And their recommendation number 11 states that clarity on the possible disqualification from eligibility to stand for election 
based on dual nationality or allegiance to a foreign power, excuse me, is required. Now, there's a reason for not allowing the dual national to sit in our um, legislative assembly, as well as the fact that they have sworn allegiance to another country. We talked about, you know, um, Australia on Wednesday, as well the situation with the two senators there. But from a legal standpoint, why would you want someone who has sworn allegiance to another country running the affairs of your government? Well, we'll see you already. Once you get elected, you already swear an allegiance to Her Majesty the Queen mm -hmm. and her heirs and successors. Mm -hmm. And you also swear an allegiance to the Caymanian people. Mm -hmm. And you mean to tell me that you have to spare, you're going to be ha own allegiance to another country too? Mm -hmm. Where's your loyalty? <laughs> where does it lie? <laughs> Divided and, and, loyalty? And where does it end? Yeah. <laughs> and where does it end? Because sometimes you can have four different nationalities and your allegiance to all of them. And all of them calling you and say, listen, be, you, this is the one that, this is the nationality that, 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 that is, pro that is, par prom uh, that is prominent and, and, and paramount here. And we want you to 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 to, to tell us what you're doing over there in Cayman Islands and, and 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 what their system is and and what are you going to do, huh? And suppose they and suppose they suppose they they put you in jail because you refuse to 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 comply with 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 them and, and their and their laws and their and the, and the allegiance that you owe to them. Mm -hmm. You know the, you know our forefathers who who looked at this and 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 who agreed on this kind of constitution were not dumps. You remember, remember, they sailed to different countries too. And they saw what happens in different countries when you will lead allegiance to other people and, 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 and countries. And they put this in the country to protect us. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why they brought in the Caymanian Protection Law 1971, to protect our interests, not to protect some other people and some other people's rights and allegiances and, and, and privileges in other countries. And so, and so, and so, you should never be able to sit in the legislative assembly if you owe allegiance to another foreign power or state other than the ones that you are now the administering country, which is the UK, and your own country, which is your own people that you are elected to serve. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one, one, in, uh, one of the inconsistencies or one of the things that we saw that they didn't um, comment on was the finality of our electoral challenges here. Yes. Uh, you know, to the Grand Court. And, yes. And yes. The, 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 not, not having the ability to appeal further. We see the inconsistencies in other jurisdictions as well. We had the, uh, I think it was the Selver versus Missick case in Turks and Caicos. We had several cases in Jamaica in, 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 in regards to dual nationality. There, there's a lot of case law throughout the Caribbean that relates to it, but not, they're not all you, consistent. The, the, well, the, the thing is, when um, I was looking at this one night during the course of this week, and I'm actually now speaking from memory as mm -hmm. opposed to what I read um, um, in, in, as opposed to something that I prepared. Mm -hmm. I know, for example, that um, when the first lady from uh, Haiti uh, contested a, seat, a Senate seat in, uh, in Haiti, she was held as um, not being eligible to run for office because she couldn't demonstrate that she hadn't relinquished her American citizenship. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that limits on the ability for elected off officials to run and hold dual citizenship vary right across the Caribbean because you have Suriname and Cuba, for example, that don't even recognize dual citizenship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in order to run. And then in Barbados, in the Bahamas, I think you have to be at the age of 21, to, uh, to uh, age of 21 before you can maintain any dual citizenship. I don't know if you remember that in previously in Barbados, um, the former Prime Minister, David Thompson, he was born in the UK and was never required to surrender his British passport. But that's, you know, folks usually say that that's an, an anomaly, you know, in that in that particular situation. Skerritt, um, in from Dominica, 
he was actually taken to, to the courts because they said that um, it was alleged that he had dual citizenship with France, yes. and that put him in breach of. So I'm just <laughs> just trying to go through my memory to see all of this stuff. So and the same with Trinidad and Tobago as well. So what we do here and what we require, it's not novel. You know, this goes right throughout the world because that right to vote is so very, very important. Well, this provision in our constitution is similar to the provisions in nearly every Commonwealth constitution that you mm-hmm. can pick up. It is it is it is it is it is the bedrock really of the right to sit in the legislative assembly and the right in in the parliaments and the legislative assemblies and the right to represent people. You cannot have allegiance to another country. And you see in the ha- in Lord Ha Ha case in England, you remember that case? I've heard of it, yes, yeah. Uh-huh. Where the the gentleman was a was a was a American mm-hmm. and he went to England and he took up British citizenship and he went to Germany Germany, Germany yes. and, and he and he became a a, 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 a propagandist for the Nazis mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he was brought back to England and and, and, tried and, and for tried treason. for treason. Mm. And even though he even though he had obtained the uh, uh, British passport uh through deception. Through deception. Yeah, through, yes. deception. Mm-hmm. through deception. So you have to have some you have to have some some order in your in your in your country of who can represent you. And one of the ways to to, to do that is say you must owe allegiance to the people who actually vote for you and not for some other people who can vote for you too. Okay. In another country. We're gonna take a commercial break. When we come back, we're gonna look at the recommendation in regards to prisoners a right to stand for political office. Please stay tuned. For the record, we'll be back shortly. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. We're discussing recommendations made by the Commonwealth Observer Mission to the Cayman Islands for our 2017 general elections. On the topic of prisoners' right to stand, uh, recommendation number 12. The existing provision of the elections law regarding active and passive suffrage rights of prisoners should be reviewed in order to ensure conformity with international standards as deprivation of the right to participate in public affairs through standing for election should be proportionate and reasonable. I'm going to leave this one to the two lawyers in the house here. I'm going to leave this uh, to you guys. Just to point out that in the recent elections in uh, December of 2016 in Turks and Caicos, former Premier Michael Missick, who yeah. was on trial, yeah. was able to run. He ran as an independent. He was not successful, but it would have been interesting to see what would have happened had he been elected and depending on the outcome of his trial which continue which is continuing now it would would have been extremely interesting but here again we 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 i, I sort of sense the creeping in of european values mm-hmm. well i am going to expunge on european values because <laughs> again you and i didn't discuss this but that's where my thought went when I know that we we're going to have to do this. And you took me back to reading Aristotle of all things. Uh-huh. But, you know, the que- the question is, you know, should the electorate assess the worthiness of their candidates? Sh- should it be those of us who, you know, um, are members of the community that decide who we want to lead as opposed to laws that we uh, develop which actually imprison people? And you heard the conversation that Steve and I had at the very beginning, because one argument is that conduct such as criminal acts is simply not compatible with living in a, in a civilized community as a citizen. And if one is not capable of being a citizen, then you shouldn't be able to hold political office. But then again, that's a general view. Um, what Aristotle said uh, in a text that he called the politics, he said that the task of all citizens, however different they may be, is the stability of the association, that is, the Constitution. Therefore, the virtue of the citizen must be in relation to the Constitution. And when I was reading this, of course, you know, my mind went on Steve <laughs> because, you know, I know he's he's, our, um, he's the guy that knows. He's, in my mind, he's probably one of the most well-read with respect to our Constitution. So, you know, 
Aristotle then defines citizenship in terms of participation and holding public office. But again, it comes back to the question that I asked at the right, uh, right at the beginning, whether or not it should be us as a community that determine who we want to lead. And it was in the context of that mystic thing. Okay. Well, just, <laughs> just <laughs> from a pragmatic point of view, how would a pris- how would a prisoner because that's what it means a prison someone who's incarcerated mm-hmm. and serving time in prison how would he represent the people if he's serving time in prison how could he represent you in the legislative assembly as a, as 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 an elected person but serving time in yeah. prison don't mean that you're not reading and you're not informed yes, and yes, engaged yes but yeah. yes but mm-hmm. you have to be engaged in the public and you have to look at your constituency and stuff i mean pr- practically it couldn't even work it wouldn't be be practical because how would how would he have access to 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 to, to constituencies, to, 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 to constituencies and, and and to get released to go to go to his to to, to the meetings of the legislative assembly he would not be a prisoner then so instead of a work huh? release program you would have a um a, a, because a, you know a release program for him to 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 to, to sound out his constituency yeah and then he, and then he wouldn't be a prisoner yeah. yeah and then but the thing you know people like Mandela who had been in prison for a long long time and i get mr um dr macfield's point about you know when you're at least outside but he still remained a prisoner when he was released he was on the guarded thing there it, this thing comes in all different ways i hear what steve is saying but i'm also going to play devil's advocate because there are many many people an example being uh, Mandela, who are worthy of leadership and was just put into prisons because of prejudices that people had generally. Okay, we're going to go on to some more spicy stuff now. Voting and counting, and that's our recommendation number 13. An amendment to the elections law removing the requirement that a serial number be present on both the ballot paper and the stub of the uh, paper should be introduced in order to protect the secrecy of the vote. Alternative security measures such as the introduction of embossed paper or the use of barcodes could be undertaken. I I wholeheartedly agree with this. I have defended the fact that we do have um, a serial number uh, on the ballot paper and um, also, uh, the fact that you, on the counterfoil of the ballot paper, you also put the um, consecutive number of the voter as it appears on the register of voters, you also put that on there. And that if you had access to all of the paperwork, that means the poll book, register of electors, the counterfoils, as well as the ballot paper, that you could trace back how a person has voted. I agree. But we have pointed out yes. that the custody of those are reside with the governor and they're destroyed after 12 months in the presence of justice of the peace. They're, they're burnt and destroyed, but the potential is there. What we have never seen in the Cayman Islands is the need to refer back to a ballot paper in any court case, because that's what is basically for, you know, if I said my vote wasn't counted correctly or, you know, I voted for a particular person, but for some reason my vote wasn't counted and you had to revert back to those ballot papers, you know, the courts could do it. It has never arisen before. So if it has never arisen before, um, in all of these years, do we really need to have it there? Because there may be instances where people are deterred from voting simply because sometimes politicians will say to them, you think I can't find out and know ho- who you voted for? And mm-hmm. sometimes people hesitate to vote because of that. So if that little doubt is there, I would agree, remove it. I agree yeah. with you mm-hmm. 100%. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would say that um, we should do it sooner or later, and we shouldn't wait till the next election coming up to to be, to be able to do that. We should amend the elections law now to put that recommendation in as soon as possible. With all the other recommendation that we say that should that that, that should go into the into the, an amendment stage at mm-hmm. this particular time. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then recommendation number fourteen: consideration should be given uh, to the intermingling 
of the ballot papers for mobile and postal with the rest of the votes in a polling station within an electoral district for which they have been cast. This would then totally remove the tenuous possibility that the intent of any single voter might be revealed because the number of votes counted is so small, which would protect the secrecy of the ballot. And in the, the narrative, um, in their, um, their, their uh, observations, they talk about the fact that in some constituencies, there may have been only three postal ballots. And if you just take those three postal ballots and count them separately, now, when the postal ballots are issued, the agents and, and or their candidates can be present. They are provided with a list. So if um, Ms. Teresa, Dr. Steve, and OC have applied for a postal ballot, when it is mailed, when it is mailed out, they know that it's three. So if you have an instance where in one constituency it's only three or four or a very small amount of uh, postal ballots, by the process of elimination, you could almost tell, tell who, voted. who that person who voted. Vo uh, yes. vo voted for. And yes. that that is a strong point. Now, I know that sometimes in our uh, wanting to retain statistics and everything else, we want to know, you know how many postal ballots a person uh, received. Uh, received in terms of votes and stuff like that but should that override the secrecy you know of the ballot or the potential co uh, compromise of that so what do we think about that recommendation i think so and i think because you can you can you can garner the statistics of the of the postal ballot otherwise you can have that separately and, and when, when you make the complete report about your about the election and I think they should all should be mingled, and no one should know which one was a postal ballot, which one was not a postal ballot, because, like you said, if you only have three postal, in the situation we have only three postal ballot, all you have to do is go look down on the list to see who was not here, and you can tell who the postal ballots came from, and probably you can tell who they voted for too. Mm -hmm. Well, they they, so, they know who they so, they, so, they do so, know who so, the postal ballots were sent to because sent to, that list is uh, yes. you know uh, is so provided. so I agree with that recommendation. Okay. We have one caller. Let's see if we can take that caller before we go to headline news. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yeah, good morning, Jim. Man. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have an idea about something. We're talking about one man, one vote, and the voting is um. Uh, I think the real way to get one man, one vote is to have all the candidates. Someone voting for all the candidates. Each one of the candidates they want. Now, uh, electronic age, we can have the pictures of all the candidates. And when you go in the booth, you attach the picture of whoever you want. And it could be arranged that if you have less than the 19, it doesn't beat. Once you get at 19, it shuts off. And all the vote, what you voted for is printed out on a card which you then drop in a ballot box. Now, there could be something wrong with that, but I would like to, you all to discuss that and see how that would Can Can, can you repeat that again? Just, uh, miss the last part of that. Can Can you repeat it again no. for, for us, caller, please? If you have the pictures of all the candidates, uh -huh. and you just touch the, not the candidate, the picture of the candidate that you want, and 19 of them, mm -hmm. arrange it so that you cannot touch the same one twice. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, when you have, um, when you touch a 19, it shuts off and it's printed out. And that paper that you can fold and put in your ballot box. Now, that would be really one man, one vote. And we would have the 19 people that everyone in the island agrees that should be at the 19 in there. Okay? Now, could be some flaw in my idea there. So, let's go discuss that part for me, please. Uh, thank you very much for that caller. Uh, we have one more caller. Can we take that caller before we go to the break? Let's call her. Good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, Mr. O.C. Good morning, Mr. Steve. Good morning. And good morning, Miss Teresa. Morning. Um, your information is very, very, very good to hear. But do any of you know what's happening to the government that we 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 chose in May? 
because we're not hearing anything. We want to see pictures in the papers of who did this and and who did that, but we're not seeing work being done or, or oh, forgive me, roads being closed off and closed off now for months and months and months and months. Um, we're not hearing about Caymanians getting jobs or Caymanians being turned down, um, even from the local the local community. Um, we, all of this is happening to us. And earlier on this morning, unfortunately, I had to go and walk my two dogs, or they walking me something. <laughs> um, um, I heard uh, Dr. Steve uh, speak about the unfortunate of, of the Speaker of the House. Is it really unfortunate, and what should the people do? Or is, is it left to the govern- governor or are left to the people what should they do because this not repeatedly unfortunate this goes on and goes on and goes on and it should have been stopped from the beginning that's my opinion dr steve and and um i cannot help it but if this is this goes it it not only on the blogs it's it's in newspapers, even in different countries in Europe, okay? We get direct things from Switzerland, and they're wondering what's going on again down here. So let's, let's not fool ourselves that people can just keep disgrace in this country and, and others are, are followed by the police and and put in the papers and and do all kinds of things and spoil his reputation and 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 now can't get a job belonging to here too professional but what what anyway i said my part that's mm-hmm. my opinion and i wish you all a good day and a good weekend Thank, Thank you very much, caller. We will respond to both of those callers as soon as we return from Headline News, so please stay tuned. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me, my two co-hosts, Ms. Theresa Pitker and Dr. Steve McFeel. First caller, uh, I think, was uh, talking more about uh, at-large election as opposed to uh, one based on, on the constituencies. Uh, right, Dr. McFeel? Yes, and um, it, that recommend, that particular recommend, that particular issue was raised during the um, Boundary Commission, the Electoral Boundary Commission um, survey, and we rejected it because it was not the best um, for, the, for the country. And like the um, the technician for the camera um, for the for the, the GIS in the studio here reminded me just a while ago, reminded us a while ago is that if you had voting at large, this, this is what the, 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 the caller is talking about mm-hmm. it, you, a, a candidate would have to would have to have funds to, to canvas the whole Cayman Islands then the whole Cayman Islands he would have to, to, to campaign in, mm-hmm. West Bay, North Side East mm-hmm. End, George, mm-hmm. Don't, Cayman, Brack, everywhere and um and that would be very onerous on a candidate mm-hmm. to, 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 to to appease all of those all of those eighteen thousand people. You would certainly have so, to increase the, uh, the it, amount of money the that a candidate would, can spend. Would, could spend. <laughs> yes. And secondly, and secondly, the large constituencies like West Bay, like West Bay, Georgetown, and 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 Bordentown would 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 vote for the would for the legislative assembly. And the smaller countries like him and Brack and Northside and East End and all those would not have a vote. I mean, they 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 vote would not count mm-hmm. because because they could they would never be able to vote have the numbers to vote to put anybody into any of those nineteen people in, in, in into power. And so that system, although it might work in some other places, I know they have mixed um, they have multi member constituencies and single member constituencies. One of those countries you were talking about before, mm-hmm. you would have to have two ballot papers. Then mm-hmm. if you if you had a mix. And as you said um, before, um, before the you, the break during the break, or it is that 
we have confusion now about one ballot paper with, with in the same member constituency. What happened if you have ballot paper, two ballot papers with, to vote for 19 and then and then a ballot paper to, in the, to vote for one in the same right. member constituency, which you'd have to take into the polls all at the same time? It would call for the confusion, and we would be on the radio for the next year <laughs> <laughs> explaining to the people okay. what, 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 what's happening. We have one caller, but we want to respond to the second caller before we go mm-hmm. to the uh, other caller on there. And uh, she spoke about the deafening silence of the government. I would say not only the government, but most MLAs in particular after the elections. Everything has gone quiet. We, we haven't even had a government minister on for the record since well we, we did have the premier after the elections mm-hmm. and after that nothing nothing they're finding their nothing way. are they waiting until the legislative assembly meets before we hear from them i don't think that that's what the people anticipated when they no. voted for them and 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 she said she i think she directed this question to me about the unfortunate yes. situation that mm-hmm. the speaker finds. It's unfortunate, sure, because it's unfortunate for, for him to get in a, in, in a position in a foreign country where where he now he's now under the jurisdiction of, 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 of other people who might not um, be sympathetic to, to his cause. And, and that's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that he has put us in a position now where we have so much publicity. And and uh, for that coming out coming out of of, of the alleged actions of his, of his alleged action that's what's unfortunate about it as she rightly mentioned and it's true it's all over the, the, the newspaper internationally and the Gleaner and the and the, the and the Jamaica Observer everywhere in the Miami Herald everywhere that's the unfortunateness of it and um, what is the government going to do the government can't do a thing about it because. He's not the servant of of the government, and it's not the same. It's not similar to 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 the firing of Kenneth Bryan when he uh, was was arrested for an uh, an, an, uh, on an alleged criminal offense. The speaker is uh, is elected by the, the people of the Cayman Islands through their nineteen representatives, and it's them who who has who can remove him or who can ask him to resign. And usually, the speaker. Cannot be removed unless he has committed some some criminal offense, or he has an infirmity in body and mind, or by a motion of no confidence mm-hmm. by all the, the the legislative assembly members. So so um so so the fact that that the government is not saying anything about it, the fact that the, the that the that the um that that the premier is not saying anything about it, you see, he can't say anything about it. Um, because it's, it's 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 quite premature to be saying exactly. anything about it now, yep. uh, uh, to say the least. Okay, let's go to the next caller. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Oh, see, um, Mr. Maxfield and Teresa, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, oh, see, um, question for you. How, why it is that a good percentage of the Caymanians or the people in this country are so quick to judge and condemn? And the, 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 politics. I don't think personal hatred has any part in politics. I don't care where it is, especially in Cayman. And the people that has personal hatred against another politician, my personal views are not. I think they should be the one that resigns, not calling for somebody else to resign. That's my two cents in the morning because I'm sick of what is happening in this country with, with some of the people. You don't condemn somebody until they're guilty, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Thank you very much. For yep. I agree, and you don't yes. kick a man yes. when he's down. Yes. You know, you 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 uh, you never know what may happen to you at some point in time. So you you no one should rejoice. You know, when somebody else. Uh, meets a roadblock or, um, you know, has a challenge, you know, in their life. No one should rejoice, you know, on that. And, and that I'll is be, why I'll we have kept the conversation here to a minimal, minimum, and we have ba- basically discussed the legal ramifications in terms of the position of the speaker and the removal of the speaker and, no, and nothing more than that. And, 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 to, and, to, and to, to carry on further from what you just said, Look at the unfortunate position of that uh, doctor who came from Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Within 40 minutes, t- half an hour, she left Jamaica. And with half an hour, she stepped off on the Caymanian soil. And within the next 10 or t- 15 minutes, she was 
on her mm-hmm. way to go across the street to get her motor car to go back to her work that morning to go mm-hmm. to work mm-hmm. that morning and look what happened to her yeah. you never know yeah. you never know that's what's unfortunate about life mm-hmm. and about uh, things that can happen to you you never you, you actually really don't know and even though she the latest suggested that well this, this happened before sure it probably happened before sure that's a problem but that's the problem that caused the unfortunate situation mm-hmm. you see Okay, we have uh, two callers, Paul. First caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning again, Mr. So Ossian. Good, good morning again. Uh, this is about the Honorable Michaela Bush. Now, people are so quick to jump down his throat. But let me put it in proper perspective. This is a gentleman that served the Cayman for many years, the father of the house. He has done a lot of good for this island at one point. The other point, it is well known that a lot of people have been trying to get him in some kind of trouble to get him out of the house. Right? Now here we have, on the other hand, a woman who was trained seductress in a casino. Now everyone seems to be taking her side instead of the female, the speakers, Mr. Bush's side. All it has to do, somebody set her up. So time is, oh, you know, you rub the belly of Buddha, you know, you get good luck. Eh? You just touch down the buttocks, I'll give you good luck. I mean, he's talking like that. I mean, you don't even think about anything. He's not doing any sexual act or anything. And you position him where the cameras can locate him. And it's a way for them to make money. A high-profile figure like Mr. Bush. Now, I say, let him... That without sin, cast the first stone. I want the rich members of the seven who has not been uh, seduced or had any thoughts, immoral thoughts about a woman, right? And also, the prominent members of this society right, should be sending emails and blog whatever to the people in Miami. Defending the speaker, yeah. he has an eminent, a, a positive reputation here for many, many years. Mm. And this other, I don't know whether it's a prostitute or a con artist or what, right? Just because he put his hand on her, right? To me, that is irrelevant. Thank you. Thank you very much, caller, for that. Just want to point out that we um, don't know the full details exactly. and hence why we have not uh, commented, yeah. you know, on that because we do not know the uh, details of anything. And I should also point out that other than people asking the question, persons asking the question in relation to the Legislative Assembly and his position there, we are not aware of any member of the Legislative Assembly who has called for his removal mm-hmm. or for him to step down. These are all conjectures being made by the public, but we have not, we do not know of anyone who has made those suggestions. Uh, let's go to the next caller. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, O.C. Good morning. Good morning belated Devo. happy birthday, happy even happy though birthday. we wished you so on Monday. <laughs> and to your panel, time is short. Okay. I, want, I just call to thank you all for the good job that you're doing. Long with you. It's very informative. You're going back to all our history and stuff, and you all keep up the good work. Okay? And uh, time is short, so I'm going to leave it with that. I want to thank you all very much for the, the tree, you for the good job you're doing. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to take that other caller after the break, Paul? Uh, take the break. We're going to... We're going to take the caller before we go to the break. Sorry. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, ma'am. Is this my turn now? Yes, it is. <laughs> good morning to Ms. Teresa and to the Mr. Dr. Matthews. Good, good morning, morning, ma'am. I'm going to make mine very short. I'm going to put two cents worth, not a five cents. <laughs> For all... <clears throat> let, me get, let me clear my truth so I can, I can get them a clear no, That is okay, man. You clear my truth. <laughs> go right ahead. Um, Korean people, the old saying that rent, 
are so gold. It is spit in the sky falling, is there? Hello? Yes, yes, yes. yes. We're, we're, we're hearing you. Go right ahead and talk. The spit in the sky is falling, is there? And that's the reason why some can't get work today. Because it's falling in their face. I'm going to leave it right there. Okay. You all have a good day and a good weekend also. Thank, thank you very you, much, thank Carla. You, thank you very much. Thank Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Art Connor. My co host Ms. Teresa Pitcairn, Dr. Steve McPhail, and we're going to a commercial break. When we return, we hope to continue to discuss the recommendations. We're almost to the end of them, uh, 21 in total, and I think we're up to... Uh, we're up to number 15, so we still have about six to go. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. We're going straight to the recommendation, straight to the recommendation. Um, participation of women. Recommendation 15, consideration should be given to introducing, to introduce strong incentives for women to participate as candidates and for parties to nominate at least 30% women to meet international commitments under the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW. CEDAW. Right, so that CEDAW, convention sorry. actually um, defines discrimination against women as any distinction, exclusion, or restriction made on the basis of sex which has the effect of or purpose of impairing or nullifying the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise by women, irrespective of their marital status, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. I don't think that that necessarily applies to us here. My two questions, for example, is whether or not women in Cayman are averse to running, election averse is the term that they use, um, and may, that may not be the case because we saw in the recent election how many women mm -hmm, ran, mm -hmm. and indeed, I don't know what strong incentives um, they were uh, referring to. Um, that's yeah, not that's not very specific, clear. Yes. But what I will say is that we know that um, when you have diverse groups of people, you're more likely to get diverse perspectives and get better decisions. And we know that women tend to be more effective as legislators, and their presence tends to mitigate a lot of the testosterone that can create toxic environments. Okay, uh, very good. So, so, um, I mean, and, you, you, and you, we're getting yeah. out. We're getting yeah. out from that historical, uh, yeah. you know, for, for, you know, dilemma that we found ourselves in, where politics were dominated by, by men. By men. By the men. But that is changing, and it's yeah. changing, uh, you know, yeah, very, very quickly. Changing, yes. You know, mm -hmm. and and we don't know if um, electing all men. In fact, I would wager to say my personal view is that when you elect all men they don't necessarily represent all the interests of the constituencies because you don't get you don't see a variety of the strengths and the cognitive styles and the interpersonal skills that are necessary when you need to when you're when you're in that kind of position okay recommendation number 17 the existing provisions of the elections law regarding campaign finance oversight and scrutiny should be reviewed to establish clear authority and possible penalties for the lack of reporting um, and transparency. The standards in public life law should be implemented and the Commission for the Standards in Public Life could take on a stronger oversight role in campaign uh, finance. Agree, completely okay. agree. Okay. But who, so so then now, t with that, and we are all in agreement with mm -hmm. that because we spoke about that before, when folks are putting marl in your yard, who's going to complain? When folks are giving you $200, $300 under the table, who is going to complain? The other day when I ran and, you know, we had a, a family that, we had someone that saw some really crazy things and he invited me and a friend to come and have a chat. And I says, well, where is the affidavit? Provide. He said, well, T, you know, I can't give you an affidavit because i got a family to raise. Mm -hmm. Done. Yeah. Okay. Funding of political parties. Recommendation number 18, political party funding could be introduced to strengthen the political party system, um, including incentives 
for uh, nominating female candidates and for making candidates less dependent on private donations. So this part in terms of the um, incentives for nominating female candidates could be tied in with the participation yeah. uh, you know, mm -hmm. of women. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. that, that certainly is something that um, I don't think that we would object to, but I want to hear from you all in relation to it, not well, me. I, I don't think that political parties should be um, funded. Funded. Um, political parties should go out and get their own funding, um, because when you start doing that, then you know you open up a whole can of worms. Um, but I do believe that um, that the um, that um, that um, that they should be that there should be campaign financing scrutiny, and that there should be more. There should be a law. There should be a law. There should be an amendment in the in the elections law to control f f campaign financing more clearly. Because when you have a person given a million dollars and you mm -hmm. have and you have great and you have and you have mid billionaire developers giving money to parties, they're not giving it for any, for for nothing. And when you have lobbyists giving them money, they're not giving it for nothing. And all every dollar that the political party receives should be recorded and should be and should be and and should be declared and 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 the and the and the um and the and the and the um the relevant agency they said it should go under the um the um the the what's this what's the 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 um the standards in public life they should be they should they they should have to report to them every penny that they make and every penny they have, and that's the reason why they should, the political party should have should have auditors, and they should have uh, accountants, and they, to 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 make a report to the to the to that to that body every three months or every six months or whatever the law says it should be. Okay, we still have our uh, recommendations nineteen, um, twenty, and twenty one, and some of them are really interested. I'm not. I don't think we're going to get to those this morning. We have one caller, so we're going to take the caller, uh, and then after the caller, then we're going to go to um, closing comments from both of you. Uh, caller, good morning. Welcome to For the morning Record. To you, Mr. Good morning to Mr. Easter. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Quick questions. Earlier on, I think, and I must um, echo what my friend Sai once said, it's really something uh, really inspired what all three of you are doing here. We cannot, you know, thank you enough for that. It's what we're learning on the learning teaching you're doing what that that. Thank you. Um, you were talking earlier on something, I didn't hear all of it, about the Bermuda elections and, and comments made that were um, this, this disrespectful to them or something. Well, we're, they were talking about the uh, editorial and an article in the uh, Compass uh, this morning in relation to the Bermuda um, elections. Um, the editorial is hit... Um, Headline: Bermuda, an island in trouble waters, and uh, an article that states Bermuda election result could impact the Cayman Islands. Oh, I, I see. Well, did they have observers there for that? No, no sir. No. There were none. None. So they were given the option to refuse to have them, or, or more more than likely, uh, the governor probably approached the. Um, Premier, as well as the leader of the opposition, because the government, at the end of the day, has to agree to the presence of observers. Of observers. Yes. Okay. Uh, just one quick question. Um, when you're talking about the ability to be uh, run for office, what happens if a Caymanian has, um, born Caymanian has served in the military, like the U.S. military, you have to swear allegiance to the flag, to the country, and all that when you're in the military. If, if you even gave up your citizenship, you still have that with you or on your head because you'd have to turn back in your medals and this or anything to clear yourself from that. Would that person be able to run for, for office? Well, if, if they're required to uh, relinquish their citizenship, as long as they relinquish their citizenship, if the, the, the law requires it, then that is that is all that is necessary. I see, I see. Dr. Maxfield, were you ever able to find out any 
anything about that murder I talked about so long ago. My mother always talked about all her life. The one where she said the old lady was saying the one that finds her killer. And and she remembered that so well it happened that just the scene nineteen eighteen and nineteen twenty two or something like that. I just wanted to get through. No, I didn't I was not able to, f- to track down anyone um who knew about that. Uh, there's a there's one s- for the source that I'm supposed to um, track down, but but who does not live on the island anymore now? But I haven't yeah. been able to get their number or their write to them uh, at their address to to see yeah. what what they have to say about it. I just a little matter of interest. I think my old friend Mr. Stacy Solomon did run for um, elections in Jamaica in the sixties. Yes, he did run the but uh, you, just, but Jamaica I, was you, Jamaica yeah. was on came, Jamaica and came and was almost one country at the time. Yeah, but yes. I think it was in the sixty six or yeah. sixty two election. Thank you all for thank all you. this wonderful service. Have a great day. You too, sir. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to also point out that the the uh, the CPA's um, the arm the B. IMR, which stands for British Islands and Mediterranean Region, their observer mission only began their work, only started in 2011. So they're only um, six years old in terms of their uh, observation. We have seen in the uh, independent countries that CARICOM also has observer missions That's that they right. send to, to, to many of them. So in many instances, if, if mm-hmm. we don't have the CPA, you have the uh, common uh, car, car come observer mission yeah. uh, that will uh, attend all the missions. But I want to give both of you an opportunity for some closing remarks, starting with Ms. T. Yeah, remember before I left um, on Wednesday, you asked me to um, uh, uh, follow up on an email that came in and um, to put that in the context of what uh, is going on with immigration. Well, I discovered that we, that there's, there are folks who have circulated as many as 225 resumes beginning this year. So you, and I've spoken to a few people and these aren't folks that don't have abilities and skill sets that we need, um, OC. 225 (laughs) resumes. My I, I ju- my heart. And how many re- responses received? Uh, received a few, but for the most part, zero. Wow. Yeah, I my heart went to. I mean, I I knew it was. I knew what was out there, you know. But again, coming back to this truth serum, you know, there is this silence, and you know, I'm gonna be very ethnic. No, when all these people that were running for office were beating up their gum, saying how they gonna deliver this, they gonna deliver that, and this is just like listening to a mouse. Poof. You're not hearing, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, you know, honestly, you don't hear a thing. And what about the people? You know, we remember we kept saying that, you know, we got to keep the government um, accountable, make them responsive. If we as a community don't p- play our part in keeping people accountable, this is what you get. This is what you get. So true. So true. Doc. I would just like to comment on the... Um, the um, opposition members of, uh, appoint shadow ministers their release um, that they said and I would just like to read a few things somebody says the members of the legislative assembly who are not part of the of the government national unity and who sit on the opposite side of the house have organized as a formal opposition the leader of the opposition Honorable D. Ezra Miller has appointed the following shadow members the leader of opposition will sh- the leader of the opposition will shadow the premier and deputy governor. And then he's, and then it goes on to say the deputy leader of the opposition will shadow the minister of education, youth, sports and agriculture, but it doesn't say who the leader of the opposition is. And then it goes on to say the member from East End will shadow the minister of Com- commerce, planning and infrastructure and tourism and transport. Now we know who the minister, the member from East End is, but the wider public we might not know. Mm-hmm. And it should name that person. Okay. And also the member from Bodden Town, West will shadow the Minister of Public Finance. It should also name that person too and say who's the, who's the member from Bodden Town, West. And it says the member from Georgetown Central will shadow the Minister of Community Affairs and Culture, Housing and Environment. 
but it sh- th- that that person is not named in the in the in the communique, and it says the member of Sawana will will offer his advice and experience or, or across all ministries. The, I am glad to see that they have sent out a, an immediate release, but they should make it a little clearer so that people can understand the names of those ministers and who they are. I would just like to read to leave you with 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 with, with this quote. You know, a lot of stuff is going on now. And um, and we talk. They're talking about. We haven't heard nothing from the um, from the from the the, the new elected um, members of the legislative assembly. I think it's nearly three months now since they have been elected. It's going on to be. Is it two months or three months since they have gone on to be elected? May, June, July. Uh, going yeah. on two months. Now, no, two yes. months. Well, I would just like to leave your listeners here and abroad with an old African quote, <laughs> and it says, "Power wears out those." who do not know how to use it. <laughs> so I'll leave it with that. Very interesting, very interesting. Folks, I want to thank you for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands, into your places of work, be it an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I also want to remind you that we are brothers and our sisters keepers. There is always someone out there who's less fortunate than we are, and I ask you to extend a helping hand to them. If you can't do that, then I suggest you donate to where the charity, because we always want to consider those who need, not necessarily those who want. I say to you, have a great day. Have a great weekend. Continue to support your radio station. Radio Cayman, join Mr. Gilbert McLean at 12 noon for a talk today. Have a blessed day weekend and as usual we ask the good lord to bless these three beautiful wonderful cayman islands informative impartial insightful this is your talk show 1-800-534-8255 your calls your input this is for the record